We just witnessed the fastest growth in computing since the introduction of the Windows PC, and Intel missed it. Let's see how Intel is trying to change the next wave of computing. The transistor is really the heart and soul of all digital products. All great products require great transistors behind them. But in Silicon Valley, better doesn't always mean more cores, more power, or even more expensive. In this 26th episode of Chip Wars, let's look at Intel. How it succeeded, and how it failed, and how it's hoping to regain its dominance in computing. In past videos, I've talked about how PC sales have been going down, and Intel, in response to that, is really pushing itself into the tablet market. But new markets and new platforms are beginning to take shape with new smart products. Intel definitely doesn't want to miss out on the next wave of computing, as embedded technology makes a big comeback. So let's see what Intel is doing to create future platforms that might help improve our daily lives. Part 1. Intel's Strengths Of all chip companies, Intel definitely has the most momentum. Back in the day, using computers was really reserved for an exclusive club of PhD and graduate students who had the opportunity to use mainframes that cost millions of dollars to produce. Then, in the 1970s, Intel helped create the first computing platform that was targeted towards consumers like us. They did this by introducing a general-purpose computing platform to entrepreneurs here in Santa Clara Valley. Together, these startups put the personal in computing. Now, at the time, silicon was actually made here in the valley, hence the name, and Intel had some competition. The relentless cycle of innovation forced companies to invest more and more money into larger and more complex chip foundries to manufacture better and better chips. But as technology progressed, they had to sell even more chips in order to cover their huge capital costs. Most companies couldn't compete, and eventually the semiconductor industry consolidated. Today, most of the survivors mostly focus on chip design while outsourcing production to other foundries. Except for Intel. In the 1960s, Gordon Moore described the relentless march of innovation as transistors doubled in count every two years. When he founded Intel a few years later, he infused the company with this belief in what we now call Moore's Law. Because this startup was committed to making better and better chips every two years, Intel won the PC wars when IBM chose the x86 architecture for its new line of PCs. Because it's one of the few companies designing and manufacturing its own chips, Intel could innovate faster than all its competitors. The best tech companies are usually highly integrated. So together with Windows, the x86 design became the de facto standard for the most popular computing platform of all time. Until now. Part 2. Intel's Biggest Mistake Let's rewind the clock back to 2005 when both Apple and Google were thinking about creating a new mobile platform that would bring computing to cell phones. At the time, the CEO of Intel described a really tough meeting with Apple. He said there was a chip that they were interested in that they wanted to pay a certain price for and not a nickel more, and that price was below our forecasted cost. In hindsight, our forecasted cost was wrong, and the volume was 100 times greater than what anybody expected. So instead, Samsung won the contract to power the first three iPhones, and later on used this expertise to manufacture its own successful line of Galaxy smartphones. The problem for Intel? Their chips were too expensive and required too much power. Ultimately, the introduction of the iPad in 2010 proved that an ARM-based processor was good enough to handle the most common computing tasks. And less money spent on x86 laptops meant less money for Intel. So lately, Intel has been trying to play catch-up, but most of its hardware is not compatible with the most popular mobile platforms today. Until now. Google and Android took a risk in designing the first Android TV media player around Intel's Atom processor. And also, Google just recently released a 64-bit emulator that also runs Android on Intel hardware. So now the biggest challenge, and it's definitely a tough one, is trying to convince developers to optimize their Android apps for Intel. So until then, Intel is trying to buy its way into the tablet market while promising that the losses will eventually get smaller and smaller. Next year, we'll see a continued push of Sophia, Intel chips integrated with LTE and 3G cellular radios. And to help with this, seven months ago, Intel and Rockchip a Chinese fabulous semiconductor company, agreed to work together to promote Sophia in entry-level Android devices in the first half of next year. In the premium market, Intel is promoting features like wireless charging and RealSense, a camera that can adjust focus in post-production. But without Android developer support, designing and optimizing apps for these new Intel tablets, 
it's going to be really hard for the company to convince people to buy into the Intel mobile device platform. However, Intel is having way more success with Chrome. Baytrail is now inside 66% of all new Chromebooks, and with Google's help, it now owns the premium segment of the Chromebook market. Also, you might remember 10 years ago, Intel shifted into focusing on graphics, which ended up being a pretty successful move for the company. Well, now Intel is shifting its resources to focus on mobile communications by introducing its first LTE radio this year, and some of you may be using it in these popular Android devices. So to wrap things up, while the mobile revolution definitely damaged Intel's dominance and it's been licking its wounds ever since, the company still has a lot of resources to make a big impact in the future. So in the next episode, let's talk about Broadwell, Skylake, and Intel's push into new platforms that hope to revolutionize how people relate and interact with computing. Basically, let's talk about Intel's plans for the future. So thank you guys for watching this episode of Chip Wars. I'm glad to have this one back into production. Uh, don't worry, the next episode is going to be up really soon. I already have everything pretty much outlined, so I'll be recording soon and hope to have it up in the next couple of days. So be safe out there, uh, drive safely, uh, enjoy time with family, take lots of pictures, and I hope to see you guys in the next video as we continue to look at how technology changes things. Oh, he wants to do one. Okay. <laughs> Get put on this thing for real, dude. Is that ever? Yeah, the ball, but the ball, ball. A ball. Mark, there. 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 Let him do one. He can. He gives it back to me. Oh. Teacher. Hmm? You want to do one, Gordo? And that's all, Lamelli. Go that's a little mini. Man, man. No! Go, 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 go. Thank you.